Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, is a progressive neurological disease that destroys nerve cells, slowly, gradually, causing more and more loss of function. ALS is sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease after the famous baseball player who was diagnosed with it. ALS often begins with muscle twitching and weakness in a limb or in slurred speech. Eventually, ALS affects control of the muscles needed to move, speak, eat, and breathe. While there is no cure for ALS, there are treatments that can help to slow the progression of the disease. And here to discuss ALS and how it can be treated is Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Jennifer Martinez-Thompson. Welcome to the program, Dr. Martinez-Thompson. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you for having me. Dr. Martinez-Thompson, so nice to have you on the program. A neurologist who treats people with ALS. Do you enjoy this job? It's, it's a difficult job, but there's a lot of things that we can offer these patients. And so it's a very rewarding experience to work with these patients and their families and be able to help them along the course of their disease. So it's very valuable. So explain the term amyotrophic lateral sclerosis to us, sure. if, if it's possible. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really based off how clinicians initially describe the disorder. So thinking back to the 19th century and the initial clinical descriptions of patients, with ALS, the amyotrophic term comes from the loss of muscle bulk, which we term atrophy of muscle. Myo Whereas meaning muscle. Myo meaning muscle. Trophic meaning, meaning shrinkage. Exactly, shrinkage yep. of the muscle. And then the lateral meaning that it tended to be lateralized on the side of the body. So it might start on the right side mm -hmm. of the body in a limb versus the left side and then spread from there. So lateralized in that sense. And sclerosis meaning that when they looked at the pathology, of the nerves, it seemed like there was loss of nerves at different portions of the spinal cord and other areas of the body, so that sclerosing component, loss of the actual nerves. Would that be amenable to scarring? Would the, yes, the Scarring yes. of the, of the cord nerves? Yes. Okay. Was there a name for ALS before Lou Gehrig came along? <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, I know that that's what we're saying, ALS, but it seems like um, for Lou Gehrig disease, that we maybe didn't understand as much about Lou Gehrig disease and ALS until that point? There had been descriptions before, but really with Lou Gehrig's is when it turned into a national light, at least in the United States. And so people started using the term Lou Gehrig's interchangeably for ALS, but it had been called ALS prior to that point. Can anyone get this disease? That's a really good question. I mean, we don't really understand the cause at this point. We can talk about that a little bit uh, more later on. But really looking at what it is that uh, underscores this disorder, we don't know of a specific trigger. So really, it can affect anybody. It can affect men and women about equally. It can affect people of different ages. There's not really an ethnic or racial predisposition. Um, and so yeah, really anybody in society can be affected. Does it run in families at all? It does. So we do understand some of the genetics uh, about the disorder. And actually in the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot more genetic discoveries. So there's a small percentage, about 10% of cases of ALS that do run in families. And so there are multiple members within the family that manifest with this weakness and the symptoms that you discussed earlier on. What exactly is happening to the nerve? Is it dying or is it malfunctioning or what's happening? That's a good question. So it is actual degeneration of the nerve itself. Um, we don't know what the initial trigger is that causes that initial degeneration, but once it starts, we think it's almost like a domino effect. And so if it starts in a region of the body and there's the degeneration, then it spreads from that point to other points in the body, and then it almost takes a life of its own. Is there an associated genetic abnormality that you can actually, actually test for, or do you know what the gene abnormality is? So there has been a more recent genetic discovery with a gene that's called, or a mutation specifically, that's called C9ORF72 that's on a specific chromosome, chromosome nine. And that seems to be responsible for the largest proportion of cases of uh, genetically based ALS, so those that run in families. But beyond that, there's about 30 genes at this point that have been discovered, all with similar mechanisms and similar pathways involving different families um, that have been identified. But the C9ORF72 is the most common one. 
that we've identified. So Tracy kind of alluded to the, the usual presenting symptoms, but expand on that for us. Will you, the most patients that you see, how do they present? So typically, it starts with weakness. It's weakness without any associated pain or sensation change. It may start in an arm or it may start in a leg. And over some period of months, that weakness can then progress to involve other muscles within that limb and then spread to involve the other limb and then from there continue to spread to involve the remaining limbs or the muscles that involve uh, facial contraction, swallowing function, speech, and breathing function. Uh, but it can vary from person to person in the way that it presents. So we do see a lot of variety uh, in terms of how the symptoms initially manifest in people. And then how do you nail down the diagnosis? So that one, it can be a very difficult diagnosis to make because, as you know, there's not a specific blood test. We do have genetic testing where we suspect it, but they're not, there's not a specific blood test that we can test for that says, yes, you have the disease or no, you do not have the disease. So it's a clinical diagnosis in the sense that you have to combine what you see on the neurologic examination, so based on the symptoms the patients have, and then combine that with testing um, specifically electromyography and nerve conduction studies, where you look at the way that the electricity, uh, electricity actually conducts through the nerves, and then with a different portion of that test, the electromyography, look for signs of nerve degeneration within the muscle, and look for specific findings in how uh, that degeneration pattern's happening that may give you a clue as to what's going on. So you have to put all of that together for a diagnosis. It does not sound like a quick process. It sounds like it must be quite an ordeal it, during this time for the patient. It is, it is, and it can be very anxiety provoking and frustrating for the patient because early on, it may be very difficult to diagnose if they have specific findings that are confined to an arm or a leg. And sometimes we do have to continue to follow closely to see how things change over time to help us come up with a more definitive diagnosis. So it does create a lot of anxiety for the patients and their families. It would make sense that the first thing that you would do I guess maybe to ease their mind, I mean, it wouldn't be a good diagnosis, but would just be to do the genetic test straight away to see if you have that malfunction in your genes. Th that's, a, that's actually an a interesting point that you raise, and it's a tricky one uh, because there are a lot of other disorders that can overlap mm -hmm. with similar features, as you might see in ALS. And so you know, testing for genetics up front, it, it can be a, an expensive ordeal, not one that's always covered by insurance. And so we want to balance that with how high we think the likelihood is that somebody has the diagnosis. Certainly in those that have a family history of ALS, we may be uh, testing for the genetic tests specifically sooner in their course, but it is a very detailed you know, discussion up front about the repercussions of genetic testing and what the results might mean for them and their families. So it sounds like it might do very well, often is very much a, a, a diagnosis of exclusion, um, that you can't really tell necessarily early on what it is. And how, for example, do you tell the difference between ALS and MS? Uh, that's a good question as well. So, you know, MS, you're looking at a central nervous system disorder. And so the findings that you see when there's central nervous system dysfunction are things like stiff muscles or what we call spasticity, weakness or slowness, slowness of movement of the muscle, and reflexes that are hyperactive, so very jumpy reflexes. Whereas in ALS, it is a disorder that affects the motor nerve specifically that travel from the brain to the spinal cord and then the connections from the spinal cord to the muscle. And so you get a different pattern of findings there in the sense that mm -hmm. you get not only that upper motor neuron dysfunction, but also that lower motor neuron component. And so there's some additional findings, like you were mentioning, the atrophy or loss in muscle bulk, sometimes loss of reflexes in combination with increased reflexes in other parts of the body 
the muscle twitching or fasciculations. And you have to look at that pattern carefully in that mixed pattern. There's not really another condition that gives you that type of mixed pattern of findings. All right, good thing there are experts like you. <laughs> All right, we're talking about ALS with a Mayo Clinic expert, neurologist, Dr. Jennifer Martinez Thompson. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about treatment options and living with ALS and this myth or matter of fact. The average life expectancy of a patient with ALS is two to five years. We'll find out. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We're back talking about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, with a Mayo Clinic expert, neurologist, Dr. Jennifer Martinez-Thompson. So myth or matter of fact, Dr. Martinez-Thompson, the average life expectancy of a patient with ALS is two to five years. Is that a myth or a fact? So that's a fact. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research looking at patients with ALS, of population-based studies, and what the survival is. And so the, the median survival is ranging anywhere from two to five years from the time of diagnosis. Uh, but there's a lot of variation within that. So we have patients that may have a more aggressive course where the disease progresses more rapidly. And in those cases, it may be less than two years since the time of diagnosis. But we are, have treated patients in our clinic that are 10, 20 years after their initial diagnosis. 20 and years. It's very slowly. They just have very slowly progressive form of the disease. Is that genetic as well? The form, the type of ALS that a patient has? That's a really good question. And so we have found that with certain genetic mutations, it may dictate um, the aggressiveness of the disease. Wow. So some may have a more rapidly progressive form, whereas others may have a more slowly progressive form. And even in the way that patients present, that may affect their disease course. So for example, patients that perhaps instead of having the weakness start in an arm or a leg, for example, may actually start with their speech or swallowing function. Mm -hmm. And those patients tend to have more aggressive diseases compared to others. No matter what form of disease they have, can you prolong the course of the disease with medications or what do you have to help treat these patients? So there are two treatments that were approved by the Food and Drug Administration, one that's been on the market since the mid-1990s. So, so it's a medicine that is called Riluzol, or Rilutec is the a trade name, and it's a tablet that uh, patients take twice a day. What the studies have found for that one is that it prolongs survival by a few months. Um, and so we have variation of whether patients are interested in that medication or not based on the findings from those initial uh, uh, clinical trials of the medication. But more recently, um, in August of 2017, a new medicine came on the market called Idaravone or Radicava. And this is a little different than the Riluzol in that it's administered through an infusion. So it's actually an intravenous administration. And it's a little bit more involved in the sense that the treatments happen in a two-week cycle, and then there's a two-week break period in between, and you repeat on a monthly cycle. What that medication, um, the, the trials that were based out of Japan showed, is that it can slow the progression of disease in patients taking that in addition to the oral tablet, the Riluzol, by about 30% uh, mm -hmm. in a select population of those patients. And so we have very limited experience at this point uh, with the Adaravone, it's been about a year that we've been treating patients, so we don't know what that means in terms of the long-term ramifications of continued use of the medication, but we're certainly excited with things that are on the horizon, um, and hopefully here in the next five years or so, there'll be some additional medications on the market just to help to prolong the course. In addition to the, those two medications that you mentioned, what else can you do or do you do for these patients? So I think really the most important thing is, is the supportive care and managing of the symptoms. People think, you know, a diagnosis of ALS, is there much that you can offer? And in fact, yes, there, there is. I mean, it's really uh, best served in a multidisciplinary environment. So teams that are designed that have a lot of expertise in, in uh, helping patients and their families with this diagnosis uh, and managing their symptoms. So. For example, the clinic that we have based out of here, it's a team of eight or nine people that meet with patients and their families every few months. So ranging from expertise from a neurologist to a physiatrist, physical occupational therapist, respiratory therapist, uh, speech therapists, 
um, and you know go expanding from that uh, and just helping to tackle any you know new issue that may arise and help the patients and their families through that. Do you have any research uh, that you're involved in 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 helping to figure out the mystery of ALS? So one of the things that we have going at Mayo are the mesenchymal stem cell trials right now. And so, you know, the ALS providers through the clinic uh, are involved in that big multicenter trial. So it's a phase three trial um, that's placebo control and double blinded. Uh, 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 testing intrathecal mesenchymal stem cell injection. So that, I know, okay, that's so a big whoa. term. That's a big term. <laughs> All right, so tell but us about what phase three means in yeah, intrathecal. Absolutely. Break so, that sentence yeah. down for me. So, <laughs> so phase three is the larger trials where we're really testing whether uh, a treatment is going to be uh, beneficial or not. And so we usually compare it to what we call placebo. So. All right, and so there's been some success with it in phase one, phase two. Now it's a bigger trial to try and prove whether or not it really is effective and how effective. Correct. So we know that it's a it's a safe medication. There's really not a lot of side, side effects associated with it. So now it's really testing is this going to be beneficial or not in patients. And so that's really the most active research that we have um, intrathecal? Right now. Intrathecal meaning that you uh, administer the medication through a spinal tap, okay. so a lumbar wow. puncture. All right, so uh, that's the biggest trial that you have going right Mm now. Um, Additional research into trying to find the cause of this or who might be predisposed or likely to get it? So some of the other research is expanding on the genetics that we talked about earlier. Uh, So really trying to figure out in individuals that perhaps with the initial round of genetic testing, there wasn't something specific identified. If there are any additional genetic factors that may predispose them to the disease because one of the things that's very difficult with ALS is that it's such a wide spectrum of presentation the way people present or how aggressive the disease might be so trying to figure out can we identify specific groups of people and how the disease might evolve over time so that you can target the therapies to those specific groups of people because right now treating such a varied presentation of you know uh how, how people might present with a disease is very difficult with a single treatment. You don't know if the treatment you're giving is going to cover everybody or do you need to be more precise with how you're administering those treatments. So it's an unusual, difficult disease. And But what, what usually causes death in, in patients with ALS? And it must be a very difficult end-of-life sort of scenario. It is, and it really it's the it's the respiratory dysfunction. So breathing, uh, breathing essentially, because the breathing muscles are affected as well, um, and so it's usually a complication related to that that uh, leads to death. Will there ever be a cure? Oh well, we're very hopeful uh, in the field. Again, there's a lot of active areas of research, and so we hope that as continued therapies come on the market and we understand more of the mechanism of what causes the disease, that we can achieve a cure but it will take some time. So right now you've got two drugs plus one that you can give uh, as a spinal tap, which shows some promise. You've got occupational therapy, physical therapy, family support, so you've, you've got a lot of things, but hopefully on the horizon something even better. That's what we're hoping for. Dr. Jennifer Martinez-Thompson, she's a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic and an expert on ALS. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.